This presentation examines the two-sample t-test for means, problems, and context. When is it fair to use this test? First off, both sets of data must be simple random samples. We cannot make inferences about a population unless the sample was chosen randomly. Second, the two sets must be independent. We cannot have paired data. You cannot have the same individual measure twice. Those would be dependent samples. Thirdly, either both data sets are large or both data sets come from an underlying normal population. We recognize that that requirement satisfies the conditions of the central limit theorem. So here's our test statistic, x1 bar minus x2 bar minus mu1 minus mu2 over root s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2. Except that's not the one we typically use because h0 is usually mu1 equals mu2. And if that's the case, mu1 minus mu2 is 0. And this test statistic reduces to the one that is on the slide. So that's the standard version we will use. Now we need to look at our formula for degrees of freedom. That is somewhat complicated. A is s1 squared over n1. B is s2 squared over n2. So our degrees of freedom are a plus b squared over a squared over n1 minus 1 plus b squared over n2 minus 1. And we will certainly use a spreadsheet to help us with that computation. So here's our question. A research team wonders if there is a relationship between brain gray matter volume in cubic centimeters and childhood onset schizophrenia. The following data is in the table. So we have 32 in a non-schizophrenic group with a mean gray matter volume of 638.1 cubic centimeters. 31 folks in the schizophrenic group with a mean gray matter volume of 612.5 cubic centimeters, and you'll notice the standard deviations here are relatively large. That data is available at the site listed on the slide. So we're going to ask the question, can the team conclude that there is a significant difference, that being the key word, in mean gray matter volume between schizophrenic children and non-schizophrenic children? So here's our H0 and HA, H0 mu1 equals mu2 versus HA mu1 does not equal mu2. Subtracting mu2 from both sides, we get H0 mu1 minus mu2 is 0 versus mu1 minus mu2 doesn't equal 0. And there are the statistics that we need. We want to compute the test statistic, so we will use the formula that we had seen earlier. So we're going to plug 638.1 in for x1 bar minus 612.5 plugged in for x2 bar. Divided by the square root of S1 squared, 122.2 squared over N1 over 32, plus 142.5 squared over N2 over 31. And there is what we need to compute, and I will go to Excel to assist me in that computation. So you'll notice I put in some headers, and I put in the statistics that we have. So we're going to compute the test statistic T, which will be X1 bar minus X2 bar x1 bar minus x2 bar divided by the square root of s1 squared over n1 s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2 and the test statistic t that comes back is 0.764 which does not seem like a very extreme t statistic so that indicates to us the direction this is probably going to go next we need to construct the degrees of freedom so I will also use Excel to help me with this computation so a is s1 squared over n1 equals s1 squared over n1 and b is s2 squared over n2 so s2 squared over n2 You'll notice the next header I have is a squared over n1 minus 1 so we'll quickly do that equals a squared a squared over n1 minus 1 over n1 minus 1 and then we're gonna have b squared equals b squared over n2 minus 1 over n2 minus 1 and now we're ready to compute our degrees of freedom 
a plus b squared in the numerator equals a plus b squared in the numerator divided by the sum of these two numbers, a squared over n minus 1 and b squared over n2 minus 1. So the sum of those two numbers, this number plus this number, and the degrees of freedom we get is 58.99, which sounds like it's awfully close to 59. But our standard here is to round down. So we're going to say the degrees of freedom equal 58 since we're rounding down. So now that we have the test statistic and the degrees of freedom, it is time for us to determine the p-value. H naught HA, two-tailed test. T is 0.764, degrees of freedom 58. So I need the area to the right of 0.764 and to the left of negative 0.764. So we're going to ask Minitab to find this area, since that's simpler, CDF negative 0.764 with a t of 58 degrees of freedom. And what's going to come back? The relatively large number of 223982, or 224. So there's 224 in this tail and 224 in that tail. And our p-value is the sum of those two areas. So our p-value is about 0.448, large p-value. What does that mean? Assuming h naught were true, so assuming that the schizophrenic children and the non-schizophrenic children had equal gray matter volumes. The chances of getting numbers this different just by random chance is almost 45 percent. And that seems fairly likely, which means there's a reasonable chance H0 is true. We certainly can't throw it out as being unreasonable. So since the p-value is large, we say fail to reject H0. And in context, what does that mean? There is not sufficient evidence to conclude that there is a significant difference of gray matter volume for schizophrenic children versus non-schizophrenic children. Okay, one more example. The question here says, do teens text faster than people over 30? A random sample of people were asked to text the following sentence. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The message had to be typed with no errors and no abbreviations and no use of the phone dictionary. Each subject had the message in front of them. The time was measured using a stopwatch to 0.01 seconds. And here is the data set if you're interested in examining it. So we have H0 mu1 equals mu2 versus HA mu1 is less than mu2 because we're saying the teens will have a slower time, a lower average time to text than will the adults. Subtracting mu2 from both sides, mu1 minus mu2 equals 0 versus mu1 minus mu2 is less than zero. Just quickly change to typo and the data is down here. Now we're going to find the test statistic to determine where we go next. So there's our relevant data and there is the test statistic. So x1 bar 48.43 minus 92.49 divided by s1 squared 15.28 squared over n1 over 30 plus s2 squared 28.31 squared over N2, also over 30. And then plugging those numbers into the formula to look like that, and then we will quickly do this using Excel. And the good news here, all of the programming has been done for me. So all I've got to do is plug in the new numbers. So N1 is 30. X1 bar is 48.43. S1 is 15.28. N2 is also 30. X2 bar is 92.49. And S2 is 28.31. And all of this is done. We're getting a test statistic T of negative 7.508. That is a very extreme T. And you'll notice the degrees of freedom are also done for us. The degrees of freedom are 44.57. We want to round down, so we're going to say that the degrees of freedom here are going to equal 44. Again, remember a T with a large number of degrees of freedom is fairly close to a Z. And with our Z distribution, we had 99.7% of the data within three standard deviations of the mean. So that's telling me right now that this negative 0.7502 is a fairly extreme T value. 
and our degrees of freedom here are 44, so a T with 44 is fairly close to a Z. So again, more evidence that we have an extreme value for T. So we want to find that p-value, so t is negative 7.502, df is 44. Here's a t44. I'm saying t of negative 7.502 is out here. In fact, it might even be further out. How much area is to the left of that? Well, you can see, based on my picture, not very much. We can ask Minitab to do cdf negative 7.502 with a t with 44 degrees of freedom. And Minitab comes, mini comes back with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 zeros. So it's a very small number. I usually just focus on four zeros. So we're going to say that our p-value here to four decimal places is 0. 0.0000. Now what does that mean? That means assuming the null hypothesis is true, the probability of getting numbers this different from each other just by random chance is zero to seven decimal places, which means chances are the null hypothesis was not true because something happening by random chance with that low of a probability is highly unlikely. So again, our H0 and HA, written in the alternate form by subtracting mu2, our p-value is essentially 0. And we say since the p-value is small, we reject H0, because there's a very small, small, small probability that assuming this were true, we'd get numbers like the ones we have from our uh, data sets to be that different from each other just by random chance. So we have very strong evidence to conclude that the average time for teens to send a text message is less than the average time for adults over 30. Now, is that because teens have more supple fingers? Is that because they're more coordinated? I don't think so. I would say the reason this is likely true is that teens have grown up with text messaging. It's part of their culture, whereas adults are new to the process, so they are typically going to be more slow at doing this. That will conclude this presentation.